Well, Ed, welcome to the show. I'm happy to have you as a guest. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'd say pinch me, but that's way too obvious. No, come on, Jason. <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> on the new album, to Tour Thank de you. Force. 16, 33 years. How is this possible? There's no way it's 33 years for you. Well, I know I'm only in my late 30s myself now, so <laughs> how is it possible I have 16 records? Uh, yeah, man, uh, what a ride. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about this new record. It was, it was, it was quite a ride to make because, you know, the whole world went into lockdown halfway through this record. Um, it was, it actually ended up being a, a, a plus for us. It gave us time and perspective to listen to what we were making and see how we could strip away some things and, and, and build up some other things that, I'm actually, you know, I know that this was a really difficult period for a lot of people, uh, but it really helped my record. <laughs> <laughs> How hard is it to make a record during, I mean, you start and you stop, you, you know, the, the, the proverbial pandemic pause, and you got to get back at it. But, but from what I understand, it, it made it better, right? Because you could listen to what you had already put down, and maybe you got off the hamster wheel to some extent. Yeah, and that's a good that's a good description of what happened. Really, we we've never afforded ourselves any time for reflection because mm -hmm. we tour like madmen, and then you know making records is expensive, so we're always super tight budget wise, and we we rehearse for a record and we go in and burn it off. And I've always thought that a record should be more like a snapshot than an oil painting and you know just get the stuff down and so you can get back out live and start playing the material um this time we had no choice but to sit with the material in its early stages for a long long time we had we had really just finished the bed tracks and a couple of overdubs um when we had to hit pause and I think this record really benefited from that shift in perspective and the time to to really reflect on what we had and where we might want to take it. Had we just barreled forward and finished the record, it would be a completely different record than what we ended up with. Will it will it change the way that you approach recording going forward? Probably, yeah. I, I mean, I I prefer what we ended up with here. Uh, and so I, I think it will definitely influence how we do things in the future. It's an amazing uh, feat to, to have to endure this like the rest of the world while trying to continue working. And of course, you just mentioned it as well. You, like many other musicians, couldn't be on the road. You're not, you're yeah. not seeing people, you're not interacting. That had to be, it still must be, um, just continue, uh, just a, a, a real challenge for you, a continued challenge. Well, I would encourage people to not shed a single salty tear for the guy from Bare Naked Ladies <laughs> who, <laughs> who has had a ridiculously successful run. And this pandemic pause was definitely uh, not what I would have wanted. And I miss playing live and you know, it was weird, but I was fine. Uh, right. A lot of people had a, had real struggles. They they worried about providing for their families. They were worried about getting sick. They were, you know, there were real struggles happening throughout this pandemic. And mine, uh, I was inconvenienced, <laughs> um, and and that's about all. So yeah, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend any time complaining because uh i i got to to spend a, an enormous amount of time up at my lake spot here and spend time with my family it made my record better it gave me a ton of time to reach out to people we did our selfie cam jams and we were able to point to a lot of different charities and help people out where we could so a lot you know a lot of my friends that really rely on that live income 
um, and, and touring, uh, they really struggled through this pandemic. So I, I will not, uh, I will not even pretend that my struggle compares. For sure. Yeah. A lot of young artists who um, thought that maybe, you know, pre-March of 20, that they were on their way to setting a, a career path, you know, obviously altered, hugely yeah. altered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when, when you think about being out there and, and, and doing live recordings in the future, similar to my hamster wheel question, will, will you reconsider the amount of time that, that you spend on the road going forward because of COVID? Well, uh, fortunately for me, uh, I still love what I do. Um, you know, so we're going to continue to tour and probably tour more than we need to because we love to do it. And uh, so I think we have a new appreciation as, as everybody does for what's important about life and, and how you relate to people and how you appreciate the things you have. Um, because we all got a glimpse of not having those things. Um, but we just got, we just did our first show back, uh, last weekend. We played for 10,000 people in New Jersey. How was and, that? Uh, it was amazing. It was like, it was a total blast. Um, but I knew it would be, it was like, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of fun live. We're that's one of that's part of the heart and soul of this band is the live you do. show. So you do. You I've missed that. Mm -hmm. I've missed that, and we got to do it again. And so, oh, and I'm playing in uh, Wisconsin next weekend. So, um, the slowly coming back. We're not out on tour yet, but we've got the odd show here and there. Things are slowly returning to normal. What's the hardest thing about getting back on stage after 20 months away? Is it that you got to hit the right chords? Uh, <laughs> you know, we played three new, three songs from Detour to Force in the set, uh, last weekend. And, uh, it's a lot of lyrics, honestly, like just remembering new arrangements and remembering particularly this, this record is very dense lyrically. We played new disaster, good life and flip. That's like that's more lyrics than the entire last Blue Rodeo record um, on those three <laughs> songs alone. In your face, Jim Cuddy. <laughs> <laughs> you also, I mean, you've been doing an increased amount of writing through the years. And I think, you know, part of the advice that, that you got was, um, or, or, or the path you tried to follow was, instead of trying to write one great song, you're committing yourself to writing a certain number of ideas, maybe parts of songs that fit together. And I'm guessing, and, and the lyrics on the new album are at times really heavy. Is this our 1960s moment, you know, kind of peace, love and pandemic? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, that, that advice from a long career of writing songs, that's about how to avoid writer's block because essentially if you're always trying to write your heartbreaking work of staggering genius then it just adds a layer of pressure that's completely unnecessary um for me it's about the process and just continuing to write continuing to try and hone in on ideas um express emotions experience some catharsis you know, what is this thing that's been nagging me? How, maybe if I can articulate this struggle, maybe it'll help me and maybe it'll help somebody else. Um, writing for the sake of writing. Um, you know, this whole record was written pre-pandemic, although some of the songs feel oddly specific to the experience of the pandemic. I'm, I'm thinking about New Disaster and, and Flip um, in particular, but uh, I think it's because, you know, those things that everybody struggles with, there, there are commonalities there. And I think the pandemic heightened a lot of them, but it, it, it put us into 
be forced to reckon with things that we all struggle with all the time. You the first record you bought, Kenny Rogers, the gambler, four dollars and ninety eight cents. You're, you're a country right. guy, aren't you? Yeah, I, you know, I really, um, I was really captivated by the stories told in country songs. Um, and Kenny my, Rogers had great. He told great stories. The yeah, gambler is one example. <laughs> yeah, the gambler, the coward of the county, like these harrowing stories. And I'm I'm a nine year old kid uh, just learning to play the guitar. Um, I was absolutely absolutely captivated by Kenny Rogers and and John Prine and Neil Young and um, a lot of earlier country stuff too. My parents listened exclusively to country radio in the home and in our cars. Um, Some good Merle Haggard, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Merle Haggard, Willie Nelson, um, you know, also great storytellers. Yeah. Phenomenal and and so that's why I wanted to play guitar was mm. to captivate people with a story in a song. And um, it, it wasn't, you know, there's a cheesy side of pickup trucks and old dogs. And uh, there's that side of country, which is Here's a, a quarter little, call someone who cares. Yeah, there's a there's a cheesy side of that, but there's a beautifully emotionally uh, exploratory side that writers like Dolly Parton and and Willie Nelson get to that just tap right into the heart of identity and and uh, insecurity and uh, loyalty and uh, what it means to belong and. Um, I was, I was hooked at a young age and it's, it's been a huge influence on my writing. But you didn't become a country artist. You became a pop rock artist who with, you know, great hooky lyrics and, and wonderful ballads, uh, not country ballads, but kind of rock ballads. So why not a country guy? I didn't have the voice to, to be a country singer. It's that simple. Like the the quality of the barrier to entry in country music is unbelievable. Those, the, it's another caliber of singer and I, and I wasn't there. <laughs> um, I still love the music though, uh, especially classic country stuff. I, I still put on Willie Nelson and, and Lyle Lovett and Buck Owens. Like the, those are, those are on high rotation for me. Rush's exit stage left inspired you to be in a band. What was it about that that really changed your life? Well, Rush is a band, you know, anyone in a rock band went through a Rush phase. You know, Rush is this, like, amusement park for uh, a young musician. Their songs are so intensively uh, acrobatic and... Uh, uh, interesting and different time signatures and complicated riffs and uh, complicated arrangements and interesting lyrics, you know, uh, all of a sudden your rock, the rock band you're into is making you read novels because, you know, you find out, oh, well, this whole side is a concept record based on this <laughs> novel, you know, and so, yeah. Dark uh, side of the moon. <laughs> exactly. And so exit stage left came out and and though it's a live record it, it really serves as a greatest hits for the band's career up and up until that point so it really just got me into all the earlier rush records and i became a, a massive fan like rush the bare naked ladies did something that most canadian bands really good canadian bands can't do which is break into the united states it's a popular theme um, I, I can think of some great ones, the real statics, lowest of the low, Joel Plaskett, even the tragically hip could, you know, they would fill the Air Canada Center, formerly known as the Air Canada Center with 20,000 people. And then they would play, um, you know, a small town in Western Michigan for 500. Yeah. Why? Well, I get asked the question all the time, like, why did you guys make it? And the hip didn't. And the answer is simple. We're way better than those guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, Gord Downey was one of the greatest 
front men ever in any genre of music. Um, incredible, yep. incredible poet and lyricist and absolutely captivating front man. Uh, anyone who was lucky enough to see the hip with Gord uh, is richer for the experience and intoxicating really. Yeah. And it was, a, it was a conundrum for me, just like it was for everyone else. Why the hip weren't bigger outside of Canada, but at the end of the day, it happens all the time. Like it, you know, we became really popular in America because we worked our asses off. Yes. But also there was an enormous amount of good luck and crazy timing. Like it just, it happens for some people and it doesn't, it's not because we're better performers or better writers, or we had better songs. It just happens for some people. And for some people, it, it just doesn't. And the Big Bang Theory I, I, theme changed your life. Big Bang Theory changed my life after my life had already been changed multiple times. Like, you know, we'd, we'd already been one of the biggest bands ever in Canada. Then in the late nineties, we had a billboard number one single and sold 10 million records and toured all over the world. Uh, and then almost 10 years after that, I write a song, a theme song for a television show that I don't even know if it's going to go into production when I write the song. And it ends up being one of the biggest uh, sitcoms of all time. You know, so it's such a weird thing because uh, I had already had a full career and then all of a sudden along comes a song which has been like having a hit song twice a year for the last 10 years for me. <laughs> and you also chronicled some of that, the, the roller coaster of that in Pinch Me when you really did some self reflection on fame and fame being fleeting. Yeah. Uh, and despite the fact that we had kind of had a dress rehearsal for it with our Canadian success in the early nineties, which then waned um, when stunt exploded in the late nineties in America and around the world, I knew it was going to go away because I, I, it had happened before. You know, yeah. so I tried to prepare myself for that. You know, the best part of a roller coaster is always the ride down anyway. So I kept <laughs> joking to the other guys um, when we were on top of the world. I was like, well, guys, keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle because we're about to go downhill. Wow. <laughs> you know? And you and and you went through a good number of struggles and, you know, including uh, the departure of Stephen Page, which I know for many fans was in incredibly monumental for them. What did it mean to you? It was incredibly monumental for us too. Um, you know, and, and I think people still, I know fans of early BNL still struggle with what the band is now versus what the band was then. I don't at, at all. Like, I don't struggle with it at all. The, the thing for me is all that music is still there. And I still love it all. Like, we haven't turned our back on any of that stuff. If you come see the band now, we're playing all those songs. Yeah, you do. Um, you know, I, I love those. I love those records. I'm proud of those records. And, and that's why I wanted to continue Bare Naked Ladies. Like, the choices weren't, uh, you know, continue Bare Naked Ladies with Steve or continue Bare Naked Ladies without Steve. It, it was like, don't continue at all or continue without Steve. You know, continuing with Steve was not an option. Like, we just couldn't work together anymore. Um, and Steve wanted to go off on his own. And we wanted to be in this band that we still loved, you know, and support all this material that we'd worked so hard for over 
two decades. So we parted ways because we couldn't work together anymore. And there are things about that that are sad and that are difficult. Um, but I love the records we've made as a four piece. Love them. Like I, I like them more than the early records. But I still really love those early records and I still play all that material. So uh, it feels, you know, I know it's sad for some fans, but for me, it feels like the best of both worlds because the band is still here. The band is still vibrant, still making music and playing music and still playing all that early music. So, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, you got back together a couple of years ago for one performance. Was there any thought to continuing that? Uh, no, <laughs> no, well, that's, that's, no, a there was not. Sure. Uh, that was really difficult. And I worked really, really hard to not make my own personal difficulty with that moment, uh, color fans enjoyment of that moment because i knew it was special for people and it was special for me too but it was really difficult and why well it's like you know the analogy i often make is imagine saying to somebody you should get back with your ex i really liked it when you guys were together you know i know it's 10 years later now and you have a whole new family um, but I really liked it when you guys were together. Can you just like, just for me, can, <laughs> you know, can you get back with your ex and just act like everything's cool? <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. That's the culture part. Let's talk about some cars, Ed. Yeah. You're, I thought you're... this was a car show, Jason. <laughs> what the hell? We're getting into serious emotional territory. When you start crying and I start crying, it's time to switch to cars. <laughs> yeah. You're a lover of a wide variety of vehicles. You're a car guy. Let, let's start there. Were you always... I like, I like weird vehicles more than anything. You do. You have yeah. a collection of vehicles that I don't think... Uh, you know, we've we've had Jay Leno on this program. I don't think Jay has the same kind of <laughs> eclectic collection that Ed Robertson has. I, I've seen a lot of Jay's cars up close and personal because we did his show a, a number of times. Uh, I was there when he showed up in a steam powered automobile one time. Another time he came on a motorcycle with a helicopter jet engine yes. on it. He has some pretty cool cars. Have you been to the Burbank garage? I have not. Okay. Uh, I did not. Well, we're going to have to work on that. Yeah. Well, I'd love to. Um, yeah, I like a weird car. For for many years, I drove uh, an International Harvester uh, Travel All, um, which is a such a cool wagon. I remember I had it at the studio one day, and one of the um, studio assistants had to move it while we were recording, and he came back in just glowing. He said. That it, it's like driving an atrium because <laughs> it's got all those like massive vertical square windows. Yeah, the windows. In it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very it's iconic. Such a cool car, and I I regret that I had to sell it. Um, you had to sell it. Well, I didn't have to sell it, but it was broken more than it was working, and they haven't made those cars since 1972 i was having to get parts when something broke i had to get something remanufactured and that's a it was big just, process <laughs> it was silly it was silly and finally my mechanic was like dude let me find you you know let me find you an old bronco or let me find you an old uh wagoneer or something where where i can actually get parts and keep it running for you right um, but the travel all was in the shop more than it was on the road as much as I loved that vehicle. You know, I'll tell you a testament to that vehicle. My, uh, my, my former next door neighbor, uh, Corey, lovely guy, his daughter, Emma, um, when she had her high school prom, Corey said that he offered to rent her a limo. And she said, can we rent Ed's car instead? No. 
<laughs> she wanted to go to her prom in my travel all, which was always in the driveway next to her. And I said, Cor I was on the road at the time. I said, Corey, go knock on the door. The keys are in the box in the front. You can have it. So Corey played chauffeur and drove his daughter and her friends. Imagine the photos uh, of that. The prom. Wow. Yeah. Wow. What else do you have? You've got a lot of other really interesting stuff. Give me the list. Uh, well, I recently, um, uh, having fallen in love with the Chang Li from a great Jalopnik uh, story, the Chang Li, uh, world's cheapest electric car. Electric car, yeah. Yeah, I ordered one of those uh, from the Alibaba app. And I'm completely enamored with it. First of all, I reached out via Alibaba. It's one of these things that's, you know, contact the seller. If you, if you have any inquiries. And so I said, oh, I'm wondering about uh, purchasing and uh, shipping one of these to Canada. And the response could not have gone better because my, my first correspondence was, dear, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I'm in. Like, I, I love this relationship already. Uh, and it was, honestly, it was a total pleasure. Um, the car, if, if people are not hip to the Changli, the car is $900. It was another $200 for the battery. Uh, and then it was about a thousand bucks to ship it to Canada. Um, <laughs> What's the I love it. it. It does about uh, anywhere from 20 to 25 kilometers an hour on the flats. And it's got about a 50 kilometer range. Perfect. Uh, so what, it kind what of more do you need out in the Canadian a, country? <laughs> Yeah, it's it kind of functions as a golf cart up here right. at my cottage. I can zip over to the neighbors if I need to borrow eggs or whatever. Um, then I have uh, in the driveway, I've got uh, my wife likes her uh, Porsche Macan Sport. You got to have a pickup truck when you're out in the country. So I've got a big uh, high country um, Chevy pickup. Um, I've got a couple of Audis. I've got a Jeep Wrangler. Um, I like cars. I've got a, a Bombardier uh, Maverick 1000 that I put on tracks in the wintertime. And I like I plow a two kilometer walking trail on the lake. I'm a bit nuts. I, I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you love Broncos. And, and in fact, you're, you're, you are searching for a particular Bronco. Yeah, I'm my my middle class upbringing is preventing me from uh, buying an icon Bronco and the fact that their order times are so long. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really have been looking very seriously at a beautifully restored classic Bronco, maybe from somebody like classic Broncos or, um, but I, there's something about the design of that vehicle oj aside oh, yeah. uh, the, <laughs> right. the low speed car chase has nothing to do with why i love that vehicle you could write a song um, about that i'm sure but honestly one of my main uh priorities in shopping for a vehicle right now is what you can see behind me it's got to fit a pinball machine yeah you have a, um, an assortment of pinball machines behind you you are an avid pinball collector I mean, I've never met a pinball collector in my life. You have how many? 25? Uh, I have over 50 now. Oh, excuse um, me. My, my information's old. Yeah, I, uh, it's a, a full-on mental illness at this point. 50 you know what the machines. problem was? And I, I should have gone through this with the travel all, but I started buying broken machines and learning how to fix them. And that changed everything as a collector for me. So now I can buy a machine that's not working, I can get it for a great price and I can tinker with it. And it's super fun to troubleshoot it and diagnose the problem, order the parts, get it working again. You know, I, um, this is a, what I'm sitting in now is an extension on my garage. I have uh, 13 pinball machines in here and I have another five in the actual garage part next door. I have one of those, uh, you know, snap on tools uh, massive kind of uh, 12 foot long tool chests and there's not a single tool in it. It's filled with pinball parts. Wow. Uh, 
from coils to motors to node boards to uh, flipper replacement parts. Uh, you know, because I'm, I'm pretty remote here, it actually takes quite a while to get any parts that I need. So I'm, when I buy a new machine, I think, okay, what's likely to break on this? And I just order it in advance. So I have quite a stockpile of parts from rubbers to lights to plastics, uh, and it's all right next door in the garage. As the Who said, you're a pinball wizard, Ed. There has to be a twist, but so far, Jason, I have not found it. <laughs> Why? I, I mean, I know, for those who don't know, uh, after playing gigs, and this goes back to you know the 90s or even before that, in the 80s, you'd go looking for machines uh, in local places, local coffee shops and laundromats, but most importantly, you liked playing after a gig, probably instead of drinking or smoking. Yeah, right. well, I, I never have. Uh, I'm a non-drinker, always have been. Don't smoke, don't do any drugs. So uh, I was looking for something to do after a show. You know, I think pinball machines are nearly identical in nostalgic appeal to classic cars. It's the same thing. Like it takes you back to a time in your life uh, when things were a little more carefree now people are older. They have the kind of security where they can buy that car they always wanted when they were 17. Um, I think pinball machines fill a very similar niche and, and they, they scratch a very similar itch. For me personally, pinball is very much, it's, it's rock and roll under glass. You know, it's sound, lights, energy, kinetic motion, uh, all contained in this incredible handmade uh, uh, device that that has rules and uh, logic to it, uh, just kind of endless pathways to explore. And for me, when I pick up, you know, a 1976 Gottlieb Jungle Queen, uh, there's not a, a computerized part in there it's all stepper motors and leaf switches and solenoids and uh incandescent lights you know it, to me it it's like a it's like a, a 1976 mustang you know yeah. there's an icon bronco the the lines are perfect it's mm. uh it takes you back to that time it, it makes you appreciate simplicity in design and, and yet uh, it was cutting edge engineering at the time, you know, and, and so it's a snapshot. It's a bit of a time. Snapshot time. In time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you I, grew think, up, I think it's a similar appeal. Did you grow up loving cars? Would, would your dad drive? My dad drove a Mercury Grand Marquis. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, it was as much boat as it was car uh you know my dad my dad was a uh foreman of shipping and receiving at uh, honeywell in scarborough ontario canada so modest means um my mom was a secretary or a, a secretary at uh imperial oil which became so petroleum um, you know, two parents pulling down very modest salaries and five kids, uh, living in the suburbs of Toronto. So there was not a lot of money to go around. Um, my dad drove a Mercury Marquis. My mom drove, um, a Zephyr station wagon. Hmm. Uh, well, you gotta, you gotta have something big for all those kids. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. <laughs> Uh, and then I remember when my mom traded in the Zephyr wagon and she got a brand new 1986 Pontiac Grand Am. And I thought that car was the cat's ass. You know? <laughs> I thought it was like a sports car. Um, but yeah, you know, for me early on, it was about the freedom The the, you know, my parents were very generous with just handing me the keys to our cars and 
I went to a school a little bit out of my area. Um, you know, early on, uh, I, I took the bus to school. I was not a walk to school kid. I took the bus to school. And by the time I got my driver's license, one or the other parent would let me drive them to work and then have the car for the day. And then I could pick them up. What a dream. Hmm. Total dream. And then when I was, I want to say I was 17, my older brother gave me his uh, used Toyota Corolla that he had paid $400 for. This is 1987, I want to say. It had, the floors had rusted out and uh, it had plywood floors. It had no starter motor. (laughs) Um, It, uh, I had to park it in gear and, and, like it was just a nightmare at this car, C- completely unsafe. I'm, I'm sure a friend of his did the safety under the table. Here um, go the $400. Yeah, but I, I, had to, I had to actually recruit friends at school and offer to give them a ride home in exchange for them pushing the Corolla in the parking lot so I could <laughs> pop it into second gear and get it, get it going because it didn't have a starter motor. Um, so I what guess the first car you, know, you bought first car I bought was a 1988 Volkswagen golf. Oh, I had um, the same car. Uh, I know I worked at uh, Volkswagen in Scarborough, Cedar Bray Volkswagen, the keyboard player in my high school band, his dad owned the dealership. So he gave me a, I wouldn't have been able to afford the car if he hadn't given me such a smoking deal on it um and that was you know when bnl first started doing all our early gigs that was my car that was a car that would fit a double bass i could pick up jim cregan and with the seats down the double bass would go headstock up through the front seats uh if people aren't familiar the double bass is an enormous instrument it's a big instrument Uh, yeah and you can put one in a volkswagen golf it turns out (laughs) What'd you do at the dealership? Uh, I started as a lot boy, uh, you know, doing PDI cleanings on cars. Um, and then I worked my way into the parts department and I worked in the parts department for a number of years. And then uh, the owner's son and I got the cushy job of converting the entire database for the dealership from microfiche records uh, into this newfangled computer system. So I spent an entire summer with a microfiche machine, putting these slides on and entering customer records and purchase and service history into very early spreadsheet data documents on a computer. Because we were the young, you know, we were the 16-year-old kids who could work a computer. Yeah, you were the tech stars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you, never looked at a mi- you never looked at a microfiche machine the same way again, I'm guessing. Oh, God, the a- endless hours of data input. Um, and we still joke about uh, those names that we had to uh, enter in over and over and over again um anyway yeah fun times so i worked at a car dealership my my love of cars was instilled early the first car that i wanted to buy was a, an iltis the volkswagen uh, the thing you know those cars oh, yeah of course i that was what i wanted to buy and i brought my down payment to the lot and herb bame nice man that he was said don't buy that car <laughs> <laughs> he's like i don't want to sell you that car and he sold me a much nicer car for similar money that this broken down, busted up old Iltis was going for. And it would have been more than I could handle. It would have been a project that was always broken. And he knew that. And uh, luckily he steered me into the Gulf. When you started making real money, what was the first vehicle that you wanted? 
it's it's funny because uh i remember one time in vegas we were hanging out with uh, harlan williams is is kevin in our band the comedian harlan williams is is kevin's first cousin so mm -hmm. they were roommates after high school and har is a great dude and has spent a ton of time with the band every time we go through la and vegas uh he comes and hangs out and uh i remember harlan at the blackjack table because i'd i don't know i dropped 200 bucks or something and i was like i'm going to bed guys you know it's i, I gotta pull the shoot i'm going to bed and harlan said you guys are the worst millionaires i know <laughs> <laughs> we've been we've been pretty reasonable all along i i think i was I guess because of my fiercely humble beginnings, I was really self-conscious about not doing anything extravagant. Yeah. So when, when Stunt came out, I was driving a 1992 diesel Golf oh, that I bought <laughs> used in 93 four or five this is and not kanye west stuff here <laughs> it's i'm sorry it's just not and so when stunt came out and uh one week went to number one stunt debuted at number two and sold you know I, it, it sold six million copies quickly and ended up selling over 10 million copies I said, screw this. I'm not driving a used diesel golf anymore. <laughs> so I went and bought a new Jetta. <laughs> <laughs> it was like such a, I remember my friend at the time, uh, Mark Burton said, man, if I had your money, the cars I would have, right. I was pretty, I was pretty boring. It's only in my, uh, uh, forties that I've, started to think i could probably have some cooler cars and uh so I've, I've started to explore a little bit now and now i'm looking for something classic and restored um i just did a i did a charity trip a couple of years ago where i was hosting the trip and one of the people who was on the trip was this guy peter clute who uh runs legendary motor car up here in milton ontario people might be familiar with that show and so the the dangerous thing is now i'm on legendary motor cars uh email list and i'm constantly showing my wife maybe we need a 68 barracuda <laughs> like it's purple it's pretty awesome <laughs> no more jettas yeah no more jettas here you're a pilot i am you've been a pilot for a while now um yeah most most people probably don't know that it's um how often do you fly not near as often as i would like i actually uh i had a 206 a uh, cessna 206 for a number of years and then i had a, a 206 on amphibs uh, amphibious floats which is my favorite kind of flying uh, and I'm just in the market now. I'm looking at a Cessna Caravan, which is kind of the next size up. Um, I'm trying to decide between a, a, a Caravan or, or maybe something like a, a Quest Kodiak. A lot more capable of a vehicle. A um, little faster, can carry a lot more weight, which is really important uh, in light aviation um but yeah it's uh i love it there's there's nothing like getting into a plane in the city flying up to the lake wheels retracted land on the water i've got this hydraulic lift uh dock at the end of my dock pulls the plane right up out of the water and uh it's 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 pretty badass <laughs> <laughs> But that's not something you can do kind of occasionally. I mean, no, you, know, you, you can't get rusty as a pilot, right, Ed? No, it's true. And I would say right now I am rusty. I haven't mm. been flying at stay, all in the last couple of years. Stay away. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 
Well, you know, so when I get back into it, I'm, I'm uh, looking to make a move with the plane. I've already contacted my float uh, training, uh, my float instructor and said, hey, I'm thinking about making a move and getting into a caravan. I'd love to schedule some training with you. So the first thing I'll do before I get back into flying is do a whole bunch more training uh, with a qualified instructor. Um, it's, it's something you have to take deadly serious because as I often say to people, uh, accidents are incredibly rare in aircraft, but there are you, very few fender benders, you know, you it's have not, one. yeah, it's not like a car. You can't just pull over when there's a problem, when there's a problem, it's usually a serious one. And yes, as you said, I, I did have a crash and it was, uh, it was really difficult to deal with. Um, you know, I, I thought about, we were luckily okay. We, we broke the plane and broke some trees. Um, a couple of bruises, but nobody was badly injured. Uh, and I'm, you know, incredibly grateful for that. But it, it really, I was already a very conscientious and, and very uh, fastidious and dedicated pilot. Um, but it, it spurred me to do way more training. I went from a VFR pilot after the accident. I went and did my full instrument training and got my IFR license um, and, and just made training regularly much uh, more a part of my flying routine. You still live with that feeling that you had when the plane was initially going down? No, I don't. No? Uh, I did for a couple of weeks. And uh, everything was about what if and uh, what if that had gone worse? What if I'd chosen a different direction of takeoff? What if I'd done this? What if I'd done that? Um, and I really wrestled with it. And finally, uh, the instructor I was just mentioning, Corey Ma, who's a, a great friend, uh, incredible pilot. He said, hey, I'm going to be in the area. Do you want to go flying? Uh, and this was three weeks after the accident, I was still pretty uh, confused about the whole thing. And I said, yeah, that, that'd be great. So he pulled up to my dock in a float plane and said, you know, uh, you want to sit captain or you want to be co-pilot? What do you want to do? And I said, oh, no, I'll fly. So we got in, we got, we took off, we we're flying around. He said, do you want to do some exercises? You want to do some stalls and steep turns you want to do that and I was like yeah okay let's do that and we went back to some fundamentals did a lot of and some of that training stuff is actually really fun stalls in an aircraft are really fun uh steep turns are really, really? cool really? Um, <laughs> yeah I mean you know at a safe altitude and when you know you've got a good engine it's it's fun to do an aerodynamic stall uh, and, and know that you can recover from it really quickly. Um, after running through a bunch of exercises, Corey said, how do you feel? And I said, I feel great, but I feel weird about it. I feel great. He said, you should feel great. You're a good pilot. You had an accident. <laughs> like you had an accident. And when everything went to, sh you did everything right. And everybody's okay. So stop beating yourself up about it. You had an accident. Um, and I am eternally grateful for that flight. You know, it, it came at the perfect time for my confidence as a pilot. It was right at the time where I could have gone down the road of like, I'm never flying again. Never doing it again. Sure. Yeah. And Corey had the right instinct. I guess I asked him enough questions about what I could have done differently that he finally said, I'm going over there and getting him back up in the air. Yeah, right. Um, so yeah, it's something I worked really hard for. It's something I'm very proud of. It's something that requires a lot of knowledge and, uh, and dedication and, and, and uh, high level multitasking and it's challenging and it's also really rewarding, but it's, it's something you can't be half-assed about. For sure. Rewarding, I'm sure, was working with Don Was 
as a producer, the legendary. But probably when he brought in Brian Wilson to sing Brian Wilson in his own version to you had to be one of the most unique, meaningful moments of your career, I'm guessing. It was surreal. It was absolutely surreal. And, and uh, Don didn't really prepare us for it either. He knew it would be a thrill for the band. He said, oh, a friend's going to drop by today. Uh, he wants to play you something. And, uh, you know, what are you, what are you going to expect from a friend of Don was, well, who might that be? <laughs> right. It could be Mick Jagger. <laughs> it could be Bob Dylan. It could be Tom Petty. It, you know, who's it going to be in walks Brian Wilson to play us Brian Wilson's version of our song, Brian Wilson. And at the end, he turned to us and said, is it cool? And <laughs> I said, Brian, it's the coolest fucking thing I've ever heard. <laughs> it's so cool. It's um, kind of Beach Boys-esque, right? That's, that's the yeah, way it, it was a totally different take. It, it was essentially, they had reworked the bridge of our song to be the intro uh, into the Smiley Smile portion of his show and which we reference in the song um so it was kind of this meta musical moment and and very deeply surreal um and we played brian some stuff that we were working on from our new record and he seemed to really enjoy it and then he left the studio with the uh incredible pearls of rock and roll wisdom uh, as he walked out of the control room, he said, okay, boys, don't eat too much. <laughs> <laughs> Pearls of wisdom from Brian Wilson. Thank <laughs> let, you, Brian Wilson. Lay off the genius, smorgasbord. <laughs> genius writer, vocal arranger, uh, uh, cultural icon. Don't have the second plate of food. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he had... He'd been there and done that. <laughs> For sure. Who do you want to meet in the music industry, Ed? Um, I have been fortunate to actually work with all my heroes. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, we did Farm Aid with Willie Nelson and got to hang out with him and... Um, just a couple of months ago, uh, Kim Mitchell reached out to me and uh, asked if I would be a part of the, his induction into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. So I got to, Kim said, I feel weird about just going and talking. Do you want to play something? So I got to play the first Max Webster song I ever learned on guitar with my childhood hero. Uh, and then a week after that, I spent the day in the studio with Geddy Lee and Alex Lifeson working on a super secret, actually non-musical project that I'm not at liberty to talk about uh, right now. But in one week, I played with Kim Mitchell, did my first show back from the pandemic in 18 months, and then spent a day in the studio with Getty and Alex. Like Rush. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good, it's a good life as the new Bare Naked Ladies song says. That's right. <laughs> you brought it full circle here. <laughs> yeah. Final thing, Ed, I said this at the beginning. It's hard for me to imagine that it's been 33 years because I was a university student in London, Ontario, Canada, when a demo was popped onto my desk in my dorm and it was the Bare Naked Ladies. And it was a cassette tape that I think only had two or three songs on one side, maybe a couple of other songs on the other side when you used to have to turn the thing over and <laughs> and it was the bare naked ladies and it's an incredible run that you've been on we're a long way from those free demo tapes that were being circulated at canadian universities well i'll tell you i'll correct you it was four songs on the one side oh. and then it was the same four songs on the other oh, side. oh that's right it was <laughs> <laughs> So your auto reverse cassette player 
uh, could Brilliant. spin those tracks right back for Brilliant. you. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're, you're a long way from uh, it. It's unfathomable to me. Um, you know, the evolution in technology alone that has happened alongside my career. I didn't get a cell phone till I was 28, you know, till mm. Stunt came out. I had a number one hit before I had a cell phone. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's really, <laughs> yeah, it's really been a crazy run, you know, um, it, and, and I, I have to say, I, I'm having more fun now than ever. Like those early times as a 20 year old starting a rock band and touring across the country. That's fun. That's really fun. But now when I make the music I want to make, I've got nothing to prove. I'm playing with lifelong friends that we have decades of experience together and inside jokes and, uh, references and and we've grown up together and we still love each other and and respect each other you know that the depth of that relationship is and it still has all of the fun of those early days so it's like it's the fun and excitement of being in a rock band with the perspective and depth and longevity of having had a successful career for this long so you know, people often ask, like, oh, you know, do you still, is, does it still have the same thrill for you? And it's like, it's weird to explain, but it's more thrilling now than ever before. The 16th studio album is Detour de Force. It's out now. The Bare Naked Ladies will be on tour as well in a city near you sometime soon. And he's looking for an icon Bronco. <laughs> Ed, or Ed just Ro a beautifully restored original Bronco. I'd be happy. Wonderful. Ed Robertson, thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Jason. The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio.